See what's going on here, guys? Are you learning? This is how you run a media company, right? It's, it's pretty fancy. <laughs> this is like the real ghetto way to do it. Oh, it is. Okay. You are you're paying me an appearance fee. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, this will be trademarked material. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so once you hit the uh, invite, we'll get ready to go. So um, I sent you the I sent you the Word document with some questions, and that's more or less just to guide the conversation. We can go off track as necessary, but uh, that will at least get us there. And obviously, we don't have to record this week either. So enjoy your. I'll be in Germany. Okay. Well, far out. Who are they playing? Who's Germany playing? Huh? What'd you say? It's it's just you and Jill, right? Yeah. I said, oh, you're going to Germany. Germany on Wednesday, so I can't record anyways. So you said, "Oh, this is perfect then." The whole, the whole, uh, everything all fell apart there. I'm the, waiting. The yeah, you said you had that kid? Just Brian and Joe. Look at this. Look at this. See how popular we are. Look at those. Oh, yeah. Hey, people oh. like us. We have three, three people from around the world. Brian Schrader. There we go. View, Sept, and everybody who's live streaming with us will hopefully enjoy this. Okay, make sure this is good. Video. Okay, so it's connecting. All right, we ready? Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you have to turn your volume down? Is it me again? Yeah, yeah. It might have just been me. We got it. Okay. One more second. How were pictures, gentlemen? Oh, they were excited. Yeah? Yeah. Smile. Got a smile in there. I try it. Okay. Red shot. Got a really good red shot on me. So the, the philosopher's chin grab. Were you kneeling? No, no, it wasn't the kneeling. It was the free elbow. R Rich paid more attention to Brian. Sorry, Brian. Brian's all right. Brendan. Brendan. All right, you ready, buddy? Yeah, this phone's going to fall over, but whatever. Okay, that's all right. Okay, uh, today you are listening to Sports Nerds as always. We uh, have a very, very special day because uh, Brian and I are going to be recording with two other nerds. Should we call you sports nerds? One sports nerd. I'm a sports nerd. One Brent, Brent, Brent is just nerd. Right? nerd. Uh, we're, we, we've got, a, a, I guess, a slate of questions to address today. Before we get in there, I'll let these two introduce themselves. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash sports nerds. That's where our live stream posts. So if you haven't caught the live stream yet, you can find it there. We're also on Instagram at sports.nerds and then Twitter at underscore sports nerds. You can follow us as well. You can, excuse me, watch our video on YouTube. It's just uh, youtube.com slash sports nerds. And then if you do enjoy the show, we would appreciate a review wherever you get your podcasts. We're also uh, taking donations these days. We have set it up on anchor.com. So it's actually anchor.fm slash sports nerds. If you wanted to throw us a buck, I think Brian and I phrased it perfectly last week. Those koozies that you're using weren't free. So uh, feel free to, to, to throw back to the ones who give you so much. I like that ad that Zach Johnson created for us. It was, it was, Timely and perfect. All right. With that said, Brian, are you ready? Want to jump into this? I'm set. Yeah. Okay. I can't see your face on the. Oh, I told you that. The phone was gonna on the Instagram. Okay. So Brian and I are here today with uh, two gentlemen who are in person with me in Denver, Dr. Dan Lair and Dr. Brendan Kendall. You want to introduce yourself just a little bit and then kind of talk about your area of expertise and why we would even ask you to be in this conversation? Sure. Um, I can start on Dan Lair. Um, I am a, a professor of organizational communication primarily. I also study rhetoric as well. Uh, and my area of focus has been really around the ways that we talk around work. Um, and Brendan and I have actually um, co-authored together a book on professional ethics, thinking about the ways that we talk about ethics and its relationship to work. So here thinking about, for me, as someone who is also a sports nerd, um, and not just a nerd nerd, Brandon's a big nerd, the sorts of uh, questions about how we talk about sports in, in, as, a, as a profession uh, certainly echo and reflect the kinds of dilemmas that we face um, in our own non-sports professional lives. As well. Perfect. Thanks, Dan. BK. And uh, I'm Brendan Kendall, Associate Professor of Communication at MSU Denver. 
Um, I primarily study communication ethics and also value related change in organizations. So how people go about using communication, thinking about communication in order to change things for what they think is, you know, ethics related purposes. Which is kind of why we brought you on here, right? Like perfect, perfect uh, expertise to add to this conversation. Well, and also, as you noted, I'm not a sports nerd per se. So an outside perspective uh, can be useful in as much as I'm not particularly invested uh, in sports, sporting, or, you know, uh, affiliations with any particular teams. Well, we're glad to have both of you. Brian, do you have any comments about these two? You and Dan, you yeah. said. Yeah, 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 no, it's it. You and Dan used to live two blocks away, and you used to call it over, and now he's on my podcast. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. sense. Total perfect sense, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that true? So we brought these two on today because, again, their areas of expertise uh, would definitely add to this conversation that Brian and I have been trying to have for several months now, which is really how does the consumer of sports reframe their consumption of sports in a way that makes them feel better about themselves, which is basically it. And I think we talked about, you know, whether that's a parent whose kid is playing sports or whether that's a sports commentator or something like that. So as we go through these, I made a couple notes there. I would love to hear Brendan's uh, kind of expertise or at least his perspective, knowing that you came from Clemson, right? A, a school where football is a big thing, correct? A uh, joke I heard once was that uh, Clemson uh, is a football stadium with a quaint university attached. <laughs> that sounds about right. Uh, Brian, as we're going through this, feel free to chime in, but I'm just going to get things going with the first question for these two, which is, do you see problems with the sphere of sports, whether that within the sphere of sports, whether that be playing sports by both amateurs and professionals or just sports media? Like what stands out to you two? Yeah, nothing. Sports is fine. Yeah, it's totally clean. Right? It's all good. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. There, there are no problems. Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, of course, there are problems with with with, with uh, um, that are associated with sports. If you think of problem in a kind of expansive uh, sense of the term, not just related to uh, things that you might be worried about particularly, um, or agree or disagree or disagree with, but but rather the ways that it just sort of erupts uh, into our public conversation. Everything from I know you guys have been talking a lot about Kaepernick, um, uh, for instance, and in, in, in those sorts of protests to, uh, you know, the ways that we think about um, related to the NFL, uh, CTE, and those, those kinds of issues to, um, you know, performance enhancing drugs. I mean, there, there are all sorts of issues that, 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 that we wrestle with and erupt in terms of, uh, you know, they're part of our public consciousness and then they become debates that we have that echo deeper level value questions we have about the realm outside of sports as well. Yeah, I mean, exactly, Dan. I think sports in particular is kind of a, as a whole, a dead metaphor. We use sports metaphors like we use war metaphors in business, uh, right? We use sports imagery uh, for things other than sports. I mean, think about how Kaepernick is suddenly representative of this larger democratic ideal. Um, you know, so like a phrase, uh, you know, cut me some slack as a dead metaphor. Most of us don't know, you know what that actually refers to, literally. I think in the same way, sports, like Dan said, is so ingrained in, at the very least, uh, American popular culture that uh, the ethical issues related to sports, how we talk about it, how we consume it, how we participate in it, uh, those things are really expansive. They go well beyond the realm of sport itself. So in the now, in the contemporary moment, what are some concrete problems that you see that we probably have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis as consumers of sports or even members of a society in which sports play such a significant role? I don't know that I'd identify particular uh, kinds of issues. I'd start by looking at what's our relationship to sport, right? Uh, you mentioned being a parent of a child playing a, a potentially violent or dangerous sport. That's one particular relationship, right? Participation. Uh, of our children, of ourselves. It might be consumption as a passive viewer or a consumer in the sense of uh, we're buying something uh, and other kinds of relationships that we might have. I, I have heard plenty about uh, households where, you know, one person <laughs> or NFL team, the other partner is a fan of a different NFL team and there's interpersonal kinds of issues there. Uh, so I think you start with what's the relationship rather than the set of problems because uh, we can focus on a couple of problems and look, you know, take those apart, but I think the number of possible problems are pretty endless. You? I mean, I think there's some problems, right? Like the, the, that, are, that are pretty concrete. Um, uh, you know, that sounds like the, the nerd nerd answer, right? <laughs> because you're not, because that, that, you know, I mean, certainly not everybody engages with sport on, on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. But, um, you know, I mean, you, you, yesterday, um, I wasn't sitting around watching football. I was sort of doing things with the family, but I was 
sure checking my fantasy football scores mm-hmm. right throughout, right? And, 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 and it's hard to do that um, in a space where you're not thinking about these kinds of ethical questions about what is my relationship to this product I'm engaging with, even if I don't literally have it on my television screen um, at the moment, right? I mean, so, so um, you know, that's... I think it's easy to it, it, it's pretty easy to to be a sports fan and bracket all of that stuff out and not worry yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, but if you're the second you stop that bracketing uh, and then um, you, you know you want to think about those kinds of questions, well now you're into a um, pretty complex uh, uh, set of uh, questions about what is your relationship, what are you doing. Um, you, you know, how are you implicated in, in, in things that that, that uh, don't have any easy answers? Yeah. Okay. If you want to pin me down on something in particular we could talk about, I'd say money, mm-hmm. violence and risk. Uh, probably another issue would be um, uh, freedom of speech and, you know, yeah. what speech in sports and what that means uh, more widely. Uh, abuse, sexual abuse in particular mm-hmm. uh, in some sports. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are probably four pretty big ones uh, uh, right now that, that are worth consideration. Well, I think we have a pretty good foundation there then for problems that we can begin to unpack. Brian, do you have anything to throw in here before we move on? Yeah, I'm yeah, curious, curious if you think those, those problems, problems as, as sports, sports problems, problems per se, se or, or sort of broader societal, societal problems, problems that also manifest in sports, sports and if that's a thing that matters or not. Yeah, I mean, I think... I, I, I think that there's certainly like broader societal problems that, that manifest themselves in sports and sports becomes a place where um, they can get, they, they get distilled and magnified because they take the, the controversies exist in a common place where at least a lot of us go to. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, these kind of, you know, you take something like uh, the question of, um, the question of a uh, uh, we threw free, Dan off. He's got yeah, a fan. Yeah, we did. Well, no, I mean, like Kaepernick. Uh, 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 you know, like freedom of speech, right? In the in, in the workplace, like those those controversies erupt in all different kinds of small ways and localized ways um, around the country, right? Like you, you, every election season, you'll read um, about uh, employers who will. Uh, um, tell their employees not to put bumper stickers of a Democrat or a Republican on their car. I don't know what it tends to be because they don't do that. But, but um, putting those kinds of things on, right? They, they, they erupt in small ways to get very little attention, um, but they deal with the same basic issue that uh, should NFL players be able to kneel in protest of the anthem and what, what, what is an appropriate response to that from the league and what are their rights, where are the limits of freedom of expression and private um, employment. That happens everywhere. It's just distilled in terms of sport. Um, so it's a place we debate that, we think about that. It's also a place that gets used for other non-sport ends. Right. Is the argument then that, let's okay, let's just talk about protest, that the NFL player is an employee and therefore the employee has to follow that code of conduct laid out by his uh, supervisor, right? his owner, I know it sounds terrible. Is Why is that not necessarily an argument that we're bringing up in this iteration of the protest? Because I haven't heard that argument for the last two months. Now, when it first started, got a lot of that. It has not been something that's in that conversation of late. Is there a particular reason? I mean, should, is it? I, what's different, I suppose, in this situation from the work that you two do in organizational communication? Well, I mean, I think you're right that, that that was a big part of the conversation. Uh, it was a big part of the conversation in the off season. Uh, and you heard the NFL and the owners saying, you know, we're really going to crack down hard. Um, and we're going to we're going to prevent this from happening. Right. As if that was going to just make the issue entirely go away. And certainly, like, as, at least as I get it, I guess I haven't seen anything necessarily that's looking at the full scope of things but it seems like that as a vehicle of protest has diminished somewhat but it wasn't like the owners could just say we're going to control um the work of our employees or right or our employees expression and then that's just going to get rid of the issue it didn't get rid of the issue right and part of the reason that it didn't get rid of the issue is because um this is a case where the employers don't have as much power as they might otherwise, okay. right? Yeah. Um, you, what are you going to do, right? 
right? Like, are you going to, to really ax your star running back, right? And, and, uh, um, and, 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 and kill your chances mm-hmm. at, at the season. That's a far cry from somebody who's making, you know, $8 an hour and you say, don't go put that Democrat's bumper sticker on, mm-hmm. right? Like, mm-hmm. because you can replace that $8 an hour worker easy, right? You can't replace your star running back. Easy. So, so it's, it's certainly a different issue, but that's, but, but, but that has to do with the economics of, of the employment relationship. Okay. And let me just challenge your question, uh, Sam, in as much as you say, Right. Uh, is this a situation where an employee is facing pressure from an employer? Is this a situation where a citizen is um, exercising his or her uh, fundamental rights? Right. Is it this or that? I think the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> it's both. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's both of those things. And so what popular culture encourages us to do is to ask one question rather than another. So you said it sounds terrible to say owner, but, you know, day in and day out, fantasy leagues, you know, the real big leagues, we talk about owners and ownership and owners of human capital, right, of runners. Um, and that's not necessarily just a small matter because that pattern of making sense of who are these people who are, you know, engaging in speech, right, and protest. Um, well, those choices earlier on, there's going to be an inflection there, you know, there's, there's going to be an influence. How much of the, of, I guess, the, the issue, well, now that you, that you two explained it that way, I think about those who, who have an issue with the protests. And do you see some sort of projection from the, uh, you know, stereotypical employee that most of us are towards these athletes who have more privilege to protest without getting in trouble? Or do you, is there disdain there? And is that is some of that criticism loaded with that disdain of, oh, we can't do that, but you can uh, maybe I'm, I'm less interested in what goes on inside of people's heads and sort of like what happens in their mouths. Right. The point is that people respond. Okay. Right? Protest is about generating response, generating discussion. Certainly, you know, you want people uh, on your side, whatever that might be, or join your cause. But it's also disruptive. If Colin Kaepernick were to kneel during the national anthem where we couldn't see him, mm-hmm. he wouldn't be the quote unquote Colin Kaepernick, uh, you know, that we know today and who would have been chosen as the face of the most recent Nike ad campaign. So I think part of it is whatever their response, the point is to generate a response, you know, mm-hmm. to make police brutality, uh, things like that more visible. Yeah. I mean, I, like, I certainly think, no, I don't, I, I don't think people are responding because they're like, Oh, you're able to protest and I'm not right. Like I think that, that um, people are responding because, uh, this is an issue charged around issues of race, yeah. right? It's an issue that's charged around issues of um, uh, patriotism, you know, you know, feelings of nationalism, genuine feelings mm-hmm. of nationalism, mm-hmm. right? Um, and race and nationalism intersect with each other in ways that make it a charged issue. It's not an abstract issue about the rights of expression um, in terms of employees, but the issue is there, right? Mm-hmm. And so, so I guess if you go back to the way you described that earlier, you're like, well, we aren't talking about this kind of issue, right? For me, that's what's interesting is that we're not talking about this particular, um, about that particular dimension of the issue um, in large, and, and in that um, absence of that kind of conversation uh, speaks to the ways in which um, we, we don't get into deeper questions about things like um, the right of the individual for expression in, in the employment relation, right? Because the fact, uh, uh, the fact of the matter is at the end of the day, an NFL employer is fully within their rights mm-hmm. to fire their star running back for protesting this. So that is not a freedom of speech issue, mm-hmm. right? Like that, they are an employee and, you know, I mean, I mean, there may be wrinkles around the particular state that they're in, I suppose, mm-hmm. right? But most states are at will. You can be fired for any reason you don't need cause and that includes um you you speaking right um when you're on the company dime or, or in fact even when you're not on the company dime right um you can be fired for that but we're not right like i i think that we talk here about these other kinds of issues and not about that issue um and and i i, I think that there is there, there's something interesting about the fact that we don't want to engage that particular issue because it it it, that it is a central component of mm-hmm. the case. You can be fired. That's a legal question. You know, what Dan and I work on is right. ethical questions. And legal questions are important to ethical considerations. But 
you know, to say something's legal or illegal doesn't settle the matter when it comes to ethics. Yeah. Um, it's also, as Dan said, interesting because I think really interesting ethical problems are about competing goods. It's not about doing the right thing or wrong thing. Mm -hmm. We often will argue, right, did Colin Kaepernick do the right thing or the wrong thing to the NFL owners or Donald Trump in speaking up about this matter, do the right thing or wrong thing. What's more interesting is that the ethical debate, at least one part of it, is all about um, figuring out uh, uh, right what our goods are that we want to defend right uh the right to speak right and our responsibilities as public figures that makes sense to me brian brian do you want to chime in here yeah no i mean that, that that makes a lot of sense to me but i think for me it kind of circles back to that first point about whether or not these are our sports issues right the stuff that dan was just talking about in terms of whether or not an nfl owner can fire a player uh, fire the, the star running back for, for speaking out um, on a political issue. But obviously the reason they wouldn't make that decision and don't want to make that decision, haven't made that choice, is because that would not be in their business interest, right? Instead, like, I think the NFL owners largely feel like this political issue is being foisted on them from the outside. That it oftentimes that sports is this sort of unwitting theater or I'm going to participate in this political theater um, about you know, political issues or social justice issues. And it, it does, it circles back to the very first question of, do we code those as sort of sport, you know, sports problems, again, across sports, or are those, you know, people taking advantage of um, a, a, a really popular product with players that have, um, a, you know, a really high visibility, right? It's, it's funny to kind of draw distinctions between the, the minimum wage worker with a, with a I support arm with her sticker on, on the back of their car versus the NFL player who, you know, is uh, thousands of thousands, millions of followers on their Twitter account or, you know, is uh, see thousands of people watch them in post-game interviews, et cetera. Like the thing that makes them visible and gives them a platform is also seemingly the thing that the ownership is, is kind of fighting back against and it's if there's a tension between is it a sports issue or is it like an organization issue i don't know if that was a question but but again right you phrased it as a, is it a this or a that so same answer yeah both right it's always both and i think uh but you know the balance may shift yeah. and, and and it's also part of it is like what what is the particular story that someone is telling right about the, the ethical issue that's here right so yeah i mean i i think you're right that, that that you get this kind of story that's coming from the owners about this issue being foist upon them and all they want to do is offer this uh apolitical entertainment product right that that is this place that people can come to and just feel good when they watch that right but they're telling a very very different story when uh you know they are um, contracting with the Department of Defense to have elaborate pregame rituals, right, that are a part of uh, promoting this kind of nationalism, right? That, like, you don't hear that, oh, 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 politics is being voiced upon us. No, they're actively letting the, right, that they're actively yeah. out and seeking and working with a particular kind of politics that's, that, 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 that they're willing um, to show and demonstrate because they're, one, getting money for that politics in ways that they're not getting money um, for, for the protests, and two, because they feel like that particular um, uh, 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 narrative about politics works for them uh, in terms of reaching this sort of um, you know broader market, right? So, but it's it's what what is the story that you tell? Oh, poor me! These politics are here, but these politics are 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 just fine, right? Okay. And they're able. To Such as what? Like, can you give? So, so I mean, we know that that. Um, in the years since uh, September 11th, right, since we're on that now, you know, 17-ish year anniversary, um, that uh, the NFL in particular, right, but 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 other um, uh, leagues too have been in really close contractual arrangements with the Department of Defense to um, ramp up the sorts of pre-game kinds of celebrations, the the the, the flyovers, right, the soul, the sort of like pageantry of nationalism. Right? Yeah, that doesn't American just flags. that doesn't just organically happen right i mean it's it's always been present at sports no doubt it's not just a post september 11th um phenomenon but in it post september 11th phenomenon it is right a deliberate strategy on the part of both the military um uh, um, uh, complex, right, and uh, sports leagues to uh, be engaged in interjecting that kind of, of, of um, display, right? Mm -hmm. That's political, right? Like, like, and, and maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong, but it's political at its core. But, but 
you know, a narrative that disavows politics in one in one sense, like, oh, we don't want these politics of, of Black Lives Matter. We're not asking for that. But it's inviting politics in on the other side. Right. So it's 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 these right. Like there's different stories that are operating there about what is the relationship between the business enterprise and the politics. Right. That, 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 that that's around it. So I mean, think of it like a, like a filter, right? Sports is permeable in terms of, you know, what's a sports issue. So, um, you know, think of it as a filter. The question is, what gets through the filter, right? It's not a, a locked compartment. It's not a black box. You just want to see what gets screened out, what gets let in, and, you know, who do those choices benefit? Okay, so... I like the rationale, though, and for both of those moves, for cooperating with the Department of Defense for, for National Anthem pageantry, even if they weren't, right? That, that maybe makes good business sense to sort of link your product with patriotism and jingoism and, and the national pride, et cetera. That sort of stuff seems like a good business model. I think an owner could both say, I'm okay with those things, but also don't want fan, you know, whether or not someone decides to be an NFL fan or gives up being an NFL fan to be a referendum on whether or not people should kneel. That's simultaneously bad for business. So I see your point that like, it is them saying yes to politics in some situations and no to politics in others. But the explanation for me is, well, it's, it's you know, it's how much money I'm going to make. Sure. I, yeah, yeah. At the end of the day. I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to defend the owners either. No, no, no. By no. saying like, that, they're, that they're trying to be social justice warriors by refusing to have you know, a policy that has teeth to protect players when they want to kneel. But I do think, I, mean, I think their, their interests. Sure. Are, are, are consistent on one level. Maybe. They're, no, they're, they're, they're totally consistent. I guess what, what, what I'm talking about is what is the story that you tell around those interests, right? Because you cannot acknowledge your interests and still be able to have the power of marketing to that particular story, right? Like, like you cannot acknowledge, oh, we're doing this, this, this sort of patriotism because it's all about the money, right? Like, or we are only opposed to, to, to uh, um, the protest because it's just simply about the money, right? Like the second you do that, then you are dissolving this kind of wink that you have mm -hmm. at these bigger values. It's the same thing with the Nike campaign, right? Like Nike, the only reason that Nike is embracing Kaepernick, right, is not because Nike has this deep and abiding commitment to, 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 to Kaepernick's message. It's because they knew that if they did that, they would send their stock climbing to the highest it's ever been, which is exactly what is exactly what has happened. The second that Nike would say, oh, no, we really were just doing this as, as an economic um, ploy, then that 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 would just disappear, right? The very forces that drove their stock to the highest price ever would 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 be gone, right? So so it's it, it's like a magic spell, right? Like you you know you make this claim, it's fundamentally false. It's really kind of crassly economic at the bottom. And the second that you wink towards that claim, the whole spell you've woven would just dissipate. I mean, way, imagine, right? It works on, yeah. on, on each side. So it's like, what are the stories? The ironic thing about this though is, is like your point, extremely valid. I get it. But when these owners are, are pushed to actually put their finger on their stance, right. And stand there, um, the one time that happened was this last summer when they actually had a meeting in New York City and they, mm -hmm. they explained why they're doing this. And it came out and Brian and I have talked about it. You know, they were just honestly worried about Trump. Right. And what that like. Sure. That's yeah, where. Yeah. But but they seem it's part of Kaepernick's lawsuit. Right. Right. Exactly. They're going to like how does one enter into an actual argument or discussion with ownership? How do players and ownerships in, uh, in, enter into this discussion when when pushed to to take a stand? Uh, it kind of backfires, I wonder. I, I mean, does that. And again, this this lawsuit uh, with Kaepernick that, that might even hurt or hinder that conversation even more is what mm -hmm. I'm saying, right? I mean, because clearly it sure seems like money is the driving factor uh, between behind ownership, right? And that's their that, that's one stakeholder, okay? And then everything external to it, 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 everybody makes up a different kind of stakeholder position. It's just it's a it's a very complex uh, situation, I guess is what I'm saying. But you can never retreat to that position, right? right. Uh, so you right. say, okay, it's all yeah. about the money. Let's just uh, assume the opposite, mm -hmm. uh, you know, of what's going on here, and uh, and just take it to the extreme. Uh, if uh, it was financially valuable for um, the NFL to be explicitly racist, to make the game of football something that uh, uh, denigrated, you know, people of specific races, uh, races, and you know, uh, they said, well, hey, you know, the market made us do it. People are watching the NFL more than ever. There's a, a limit to that. And I think the key is right, absolutely there's a business interest, but um, those interests, those goods, right, that uh, they're trying to protect, 
they always have limits. And that's part of what ethics is about is, you know, putting kind of reasonable and reflective limits on extreme. Uh, you know, there, there is kind of a, about oh, sorry, moderate. sorry to interrupt. No, no, go ahead, Brent. I'm sorry, I, I'm out of the light, clearly. Um, I think there's a, there's a good sort of counterfactual, a good example of that counterfactual where you can test out what would a big sports organization do in that world. And it's, and it's at home in the NFL. Like you don't have to go back that far where most professional teams didn't want to have non-white quarterbacks, right? Or go back even a little bit farther than that before you would draft an African-American player or a non-white player or, you know, have one on your team or start one, right? So they're definitely, that came to a head at a certain point, right? Well, how, how much benefit do we get from kind of maintaining a, 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 a team that has outwardly very uh, specific appearances, right, that are, that are probably racially problematic. And at what point does that cost you money because you're not winning football games, because there's talent that you're overlooking for the wrong reasons, right, for, for, for racist reasons. So I think, I think it's an interesting example, and it kind of played out. So, so it, you mentioned, like, things coming to a head there. And I'm wondering, like, this may be overstepping in terms of the way that the dynamics of a podcast go. <laughs> I don't want to overstep your host. Or your host but speaking of things coming to a head, mm -hmm. right? Like, I, I'm wondering if we could talk about a, a sort of what is at least for me, and even like we're venturing kind of into the political, and the political certainly has has um, ethical implications to it. Um, but but thinking at a kind of more personal level about where those ethical things, again, again, this is my long riff on things coming to a head, right? But thinking about the CTE uh, kind of stuff, right? And like, what is what is the re ethical relationship of the fan to the sport in terms of the uh, in terms of the ethics that it right? Because yep. it's so easy to abstract this other issue into the bigger political and economic arguments. There, mm -hmm. ethical stuff is there, but things are much more concrete mm -hmm. at that immediate level of what responsibility do I have in this thing that's going on mm -hmm. um, when, when I'm watching. Sorry, so, to I just totally no, 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 transition. Right there, that was a good transition. I know you want to talk about it. So, I mean, we might as well. And I, I know Brian's on a, on a timer here. He's got to get out and go be a father in a bit. But what kind of linguistic magic do you see at work? <laughs> when people are trying to make sense of CTE while also consuming that sport? Because we've talked about that. I mean, I want, like, you two are the experts. Well, uh, I think one of the first mechanisms you can look at uh, is the degree to which people engage or disengage from moral consideration, okay. uh, right, or make uh, the, the ethical problem more concrete, uh, more immediate, or more abstract. Bottom line when it comes to human psychology is that we're pretty bad about thinking about things that are long way into the future. Uh, and then also things that are kind of further away from us. You know, we evolved to reason and deal with things that are right there in the moment. And that's one of the reasons I think CTE is such a hard thing when you're looking at participation, right? Mm -hmm. If your child is playing football, medical science is very clear. They are probably damaging their brain. In fact, I read something this morning, I think in the Wall Street Journal, that uh, highlighted um, the fact that doctors now, uh, groups of doctors, right, uh, medical associations, recommend that children not play contact football, American football, uh, under the age of 14. Like it, that, that the possibility for extensive and long term brain damage is greater when they play it younger. Um, so, are you, for instance, uh, allowing your child to damage his brain if you're letting him play, uh, what do they call it, Pop Warner? Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, I get my sport, sport on. There you go. Concerns. Yeah, like you're playing Pop Warner Friday Night Lights kind of, you know, kids football. Um, that's an immediate kind of thing, but you can't see a concussion, right, uh, in the same way you can see a, a, a skin wound, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you can't see long-term cognitive impairment. I mean, just think about how mm -hmm. abstract that is. Um, and so that's, I think, a real problem is is – you know, how, how immediate are we making the ethical consideration and how concrete are we making the thing we're talking about, whether it's in terms of ethics or not? Yeah. I mean, it's not even concussions, right? Like that's not, that's not even the real problem with CTE, right? Like it's not even, you see the player staggering for a moment, right? It's players who never had concussions mm -hmm. come down with CTE because of those repeated sort of micro traumas that occur too, which makes it even more abstract, right? Like just in the duration of, of playing football, um, you're in, you're in day, you know, these, this, this kind of damage um, is happening. And so uh, like one of the ways I think though that, 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 that we, 
we, we talk about it, we, we, we think about it in terms of our relationship. We certainly have a language which allows us to sort of compartmentalize, right? Um, that allows us to, uh, um, um, you know, bracket out particular spheres as a place where different kinds of ethics operate, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's certainly one of the things that that, that we do um, when, when um, we're uh, engaging Right in, in, in watching the sport, knowing the kinds of things that that, that are happening, mm -hmm. right? Um, and 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 I find myself doing this too. I think of uh, um, in, in in studies of ideology and how ideology function, right? That the, the, the classic Marxist definition of ideology is uh, they they um, they're doing it, but they don't know that they're doing it, right? right? Um, and the the the, the um, sort of <laughs> contemporary Slovenian Marxist philosopher, Slavoj Žižek. Uh, I, I, you know, there's a lot I don't like about him, though he's fun to read. But the one thing that I really do like about him is his definition of ideology, which is uh, a sort of inversion on the oldest Marxist version of ideology. He says, they know what they are doing and they do it anyway. Mm -hmm. right? And that certainly describes my relationship, right? Uh, uh, in, in, in terms of, of football um, in, in particular, um, and, and so it's, you know, like I can recognize ways in which I compartmentalize. Um, but on the other hand, right, like I, I'm always thinking about the particular stories that we tell about our ethics as well. And when I see, I, 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 I see people moralizing about this too, as if, you know, like any contact with football is, is <laughs> inherently um, entirely un, un, unethical. Um, and and I, I think that that has its own kind of, you um, narrative seduction as well too that, that can that can detract from ethical issues uh in the same way that that a certain kind of compartmentalization can i mean at the end of the yeah. day there's a difference between people who are playing football now and playing who people are playing football before cte mm -hmm. um uh, before we really know about it, right? Like there is a choice. Look no further than uh, the 49ers linebacker a couple of years ago, Chris Borland, who had a fantastic rookie campaign. Like he looked like he was going to be the next Patrick Willis, right? And and walked away from the game, right? Mm -hmm. Like there is choice involved. And I, I get worried when um, we talk about this kind of issue and sort of just bracket away right that kind of individual responsibility which which exists at, at, at all levels it exists from the levels of the of, of the nfl players who are playing the game all the way down to the the, the parents are of the pop right like i'm not going to let my kid play football right and i recognize football is probably uh, like probably going to die on the vine at some point because of parents making those kinds of choices mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that people now aren't making choices about participating in the game as well it also doesn't mean that my watching isn't feeding that choice yeah. too like like it's a, it, it's a kind of it, it's it's a really complicated um issue it's not as simple as like all or nothing I think, right. Right, in and terms of that everybody's got choices. You just don't get to choose your choices sometimes, yeah. right? So if your daddy played football and your granddaddy played football and so on and so forth, uh, you know, that changes the decision environment yeah. that you're in. Uh, I think in particular, you know, you meant, I have no idea who the hell Paul Willis is, but, you know, uh, is he the one who made the decision to walk away? Somebody Patrick else. Willis. And, 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 and uh, Chris, Bor Chris Borman was the, was the rookie right. who walked away. Okay. Yeah. You're fine. Tom Brady. That's all I got. Um, oh, but, but uh, no, but I mean, you're still going to watch No, but he, he walked away. Right? Mm -hmm. But he got to that point uh, as an amateur player in college, mm -hmm. right? And everybody who made it to the NFL and gets that choice to walk away, you know, having uh, benefited pretty significantly as a professional player, um, they got to go through that long period of not getting paid, mm -hmm. of battering their body, of mm -hmm. working a crazy mm -hmm. schedule, you know, I mean, just the work ethic it takes is, is remarkable. And the mm -hmm. sacrifices in terms of being an independent mm -hmm. young person, um, all of those things, right, are decisions they made, sure. But you don't necessarily get to choose the decisions in order to get to the place where you have that, you know, decision. I'm done. You have the decision at every point along the way in that path too, though, right? Like, I mean, I, right. that, that you, you, you can choose not to do that. And I get right. There are, there are complicating factors involved. Mm -hmm. right? like, right. like, like, yeah. like there's, there, there's no doubt about that. And, and it's not just like, like I, I get worried when I hear the story that says, Oh, it's just, an individual decision so therefore it's entirely ethical that's not that that's not the case right. either right but but 
you know, th th there's a tension, um, I, I think, between around that question of individual agency, both the agency of the fan and the agency of the, uh, uh, of, of the player to make those kinds of choices. And it's really easy to tell totalizing stories, right. which, which frees out the agency that, that either side has. And, it, and, and if, you, if you freeze out that agency, right, now where's the space for ethics, right? Like, right. wait, wait that's yeah, absolutely. Okay, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta pin, I wanna pin Brendan down here and, and get a good answer. Okay. Is, is a sports thing. Is I know. A sports I know. Um, you're, of, of the four of us, you're the one oh. who has spent significant time as a power broker of sorts at a major football institution. <laughs> At Clemson, right? power. having worked with administrators and leaders of that institution, Students. how do they frame the inequalities of the college sports system in a way that makes them go to work every day, allows them to go to work every day? Uh, it's usually telling, you know, uh, what, is, what did Emily Dickinson say? I'm, I'm referencing Emily Dickinson on the sports. <laughs> nice. uh, tell the truth. <laughs> Right. Okay. Um, you cannot tell the whole story all the time. And these are people who, like Dan said, you know, have some power, have agency. And they uh, many of the people I encountered are doing all they can to make this situation facing the student athletes and everyone else involved uh, as good as possible. Right, to take care uh, of their physical bodies, to take care of their intellectual life. Uh, at Clemson, I was quite impressed with the individuals who worked in the uh, academic tutoring center. They offer uh, extraordinary resources uh, to their student athletes at uh, Clemson University. And many of the people working with, uh, you know, uh, football players mm -hmm. are former football players. Uh, the tennis uh, uh, students, they're former, you know, athletes in tennis, and um, they're deeply committed to. Uh, uh, making this experience as meaningful and as rich and as ethical as, as they can make it. Um, the key becomes, uh, you know, uh, at where, where do you want to draw the line in terms of exploitation, right? When you exploit something, you use it for the resources. If we're talking in human terms about the negative sense of exploitation, it's utilizing someone else, uh, their bodies or their labor or anything in order to take advantage, you know, yourself in, in some unfair way. Um, and when you get right down to it, they're offering, uh, you know, uh, student athletes quite a lot at some institutions, not very much at other institutions. So you can't, again, like Dan said, tell that whole story. And even at a place like uh, at Clemson, there's a real problem when you look at just, uh, let's get back to the business factor, right? The fact that I think they were making tens of millions of dollars. I think I could totally be wrong about this, but I remember uh, someone telling me that Clemson spent something like $13 million on football, right? And they made something like $30 million mm -hmm. in terms of profit. And, you know, millions upon millions upon millions that went to one person, Coach Dabo Swinney, who uh, is probably integral to the success of the Clemson football team. But boy, that's an inequitable distribution of money. Uh, even when you monetize free tuition, uh, even when you monetize free uh, meals and free tutoring, you know, it just pales in comparison there. So, I think you see people doing, uh, I think, extraordinary work to make the situation uh, uh, one that is responsible and fair. The question is, uh, you know, where do we in that kind of storytelling tell ourselves the line is for exploitation? Um, mm -hmm. But uh, you'd never hear me kind of moralize with, say, an individual and say, you know, you're just part of the machine, man. You know, you're you're out there. You're killing Sammy Watkins. You're not mm -hmm. helping him. That kind of thing. Um, that's important. And even worse, sometimes, you know, you'll hear people say, Oh, well, why are you worried about them getting paid? That kind of thing, right? Uh, you know, those young men, they wouldn't be in school, right, uh, if it weren't for football. I mean, that's just dehumanizing, uh, assuming that, say, a football player or a soccer player or a baseball player or a gymnast, you know, uh, because they're an athlete, couldn't possibly be a student at a uh, university the caliber of wherever. Um, that's just dehumanizing. So, you know, you have these active attempts to enrich their lives, and you also see discourses that try to dehumanize uh, uh, student-athletes in order to, that we don't think ethically about them. Brian, i got one more question. Do you have anything to add here before we wrap it up? Uh, no, no, keep going. I'm good. No, I'm, okay, I'm, so... I'm, I'm, I'm being a man I'm just listening. This is great, by the way. You two are very bright. Thank you for, for, for making this show smarter. <laughs> What do we do moving forward? Like, how do we make this better? Like, how, how do we make consuming sports, uh, uh, being a sports fan, being a supporter of student athletes, what do we need to be doing in order to, to add some depth to the conversation, but also the lives of those who are so much influenced by this? 
I mean, that's a good question, right? Mm-hmm. Like the, 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 the um, for the most part, we don't have a lot of purchase, right? As mm-hmm. a, 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 as a fan, right? Uh, mm-hmm. you know, the, 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 um, you know, you know, the conversation, you know, the, the, the temptation tends to be, oh, like, let's just, let's just participate by, uh, you know, with, with our eyes, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and choosing what we watch and what we don't. And I, and I think that that's an, that's an important choice to make and something to think about, but it's not as significant as, as we'd like to think, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, we, I, I think that that's a story that we tell ourselves that feels really good, like, I'm not going to do it. And that's going to change, you know, like, Supposedly, you know, the, the people will tell you the, the, the viewership in the NFL is down because of the protests or the viewership in the NFL is down uh, because of um, uh, um, uh, uh, politics, you know, the politics yeah. right? No, the viewership in the NFL is down because of the media environment, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like, like it's not boycotts from conservatives or liberals that's, that are, that's really driving it, though it might feel good for conservatives or liberals who boycott for their political reasons to tell themselves that's the case, mm-hmm. right? Like, it's just the economics of the sport, the media environment, changing cultural preferences. Like, it it just doesn't work the way it used to yeah. when, when Monday Night Football wasn't on ABC and people had, you know, just relatively few stations to watch. It's just, so, so, so that's the only place that you have kind of um, direct purchase except for those sort of like smaller local level choices. Like you have choices about things like what your kids do, you you know, those those kinds of things. And I think that that's where you can begin to change things, right? Like um, if, if people aren't sending their kids to play football, um, then football is going to wither, right? If, if, if people are putting pressure on to, uh, um, you know, you know, change the nature of, of how those sports are structured, right? But, you know, people are refusing to, I think, a pitcher's arms injuries here, right? Um, that, that, that those repetitive, uh, you know, the, the increase in Tommy John injuries mm-hmm. may well be, although I don't think it's inclusive yet, may well be um, a sign of the reduction to one sport, right? Like, so kids just pitch their whole lives in ways they didn't used to pitch when they also used to play hockey or football or basketball or something like that, right? Like parents there could participate in ways which refuse to just funnel their kids into one particular sport. And if those kinds of choices where you can actually do something different, slowly start to bubble up, that could change the nature of sports at the big level itself, right? But it's much easier, I think, to just tell the story, like, I'm going to not watch this, and I'm going to watch that instead. Mm-hmm. Um, and know. that makes me morally righteous. And then yeah, it makes you feel morally <laughs> righteous in ways that don't, I think, engage the issue. But there are no reasons. And, 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 and I think, and I think what, what, what you have to say circles back to concussions, too, though, Dan, right? Like, maybe... maybe. 30 years ago, the NFL players from 30 years ago didn't play football until they got to high school. Right? right. They weren't playing hockey right. on They were four sport athletes or three sport athletes. And, and they probably weren't, you know, they probably weren't playing football at that point. So even even some of the safety stuff might be part of this driving your kids into one particular sport. And I, I, I kind of started off, I mean, my first question was are these sports issues or are these sort of social issues that get placed on sports? If, if we think about sports from the other perspective, which is what arguments do people tend to make about why sports are good? It tends to be stuff like participation, teamwork, making friends, learning how to fail, leadership skills, etc. That stuff goes away with one sport athlete too. Right? If, if you're just like, my kid's going to be on a travel baseball team at age six, and they're never going to play any other sports. All you're teaching them is the competitive stuff. All you're teaching them is, you know, for you to win, everybody else has to lose. You're missing all the other sort of, you know, uh, happy-go-lucky stuff that we tend to associate with sports that maybe is getting left at the wayside. wayside. And, and, and again, it's like sports is a place where we really see that happening. It's really – but it's happening everywhere else too, right? I mean, I just um, – you know, it – you just think if you're going to get about like the kinds of choices that parents might be making for their kids, right? Even if it, they're, they're not in sports, right? How many parents are sort of, um, you know, making choices that really narrow uh, their kids' experiences and mm-hmm. education around getting into an Ivy League school and that's starting earlier and earlier and earlier, right? Like, you know, like that, you know, those kinds of issues might be harder to see because they're more diffuse and they don't necessarily show up in the space that, that kind of we all share, but that's a, um, 
I mean, I think that, that, that that's a social pressure that is not unique to sport, but one that becomes really easy to see when it shows up in sports. That's an excellent point. Yeah. Brennan, any closing comments? Yeah. Three small things. Uh, one, I think you got to balance humility with responsibility, right? Uh, being humble means recognizing the limits of what you can do, you know, in order to shape things for the better and also, you know, the way in which your actions might represent or create bad, right, to be unethical. Uh, and then responsibility, not using, right, uh, that position of humility to let yourself off the hook. So if you're a Redskins fan, like, you have to understand that to whatever degree you want to take it, right? You are uh, a fan, probably have purchased, uh, you know, a, a t-shirt or something like that, uh, that represents uh, a racist slogan and imagery. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, you might have to wrestle with that. And it might be difficult. But you should take responsibility to the degree that it's uh, worthwhile considering that. There are a couple of things that I think can shape that balance of humility and responsibility. One is understanding cognitive dissonance, right? Leon Bessinger's uh, just classic theory about how we deal with kind of, uh, you know, conflicts in our psyche. Uh, you know, folks who are listening should just go check it out, learn a lot more. I think it has, uh, it's a theory that's got a lot of power. But how do you deal with things that don't make sense or that you feel uneasy about? Um, and be able to do that in a way that you are thinking through it, you're reasoning through it rather than just reacting. And then uh, I think the second thing that's really useful in kind of taking stock about uh, you know, our choices related to sports and consuming sports uh, is uh, A.O. Hirschman's uh, model of how we respond to organizational decline. If we think something's not quite right or smells fishy, we got choices. If we could exit, meaning, you know, all right, I'm not watching football anymore. I'm going to watch rugby. Oh, shoot. Okay, Cricket. Same. Cricket's cricket. a good choice. All right. <laughs> it's, yeah, cricket, right? We're watching cricket. Great. That's an exit choice, right? We can neglect it. I mean, la, 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 I'm not going to think about it. That's, we neglect that kind of uh, moral issue facing us. We can show loyalty, right? Packers for life kind of a thing. You know, I grew up watching these guys play. Uh, and, you know, we now know that there are some different, uh, different problems in these sports. We now know that, you know, cyclists are doping or whatever, we, but we can still be loyal. And the last one is voice. You can actually kind of express the concerns you have related to some sort of moral problem or a, a little inkling of a feeling. And I think that's the best thing to do. It's what we're doing here, right? Taking some issues that you, uh, you know, you're, you're thinking about related sports and talking it through, reasoning through it with other people, uh, you know, get out of your head and, you know, get into conversation. I think that's really valuable. Well, Brian, and I can't thank you too enough. I think uh, we certainly added a lot of depth to this conversation, so I appreciate it very much. Uh, Dr. Dan Lair, Dr. Brendan Kendall, uh, we very much appreciate you coming on the show. Brian, go pick up your kiddos. Everybody, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Find us on the social medias. Uh, leave us a review. And if you want to give us some money, we'd appreciate that. too. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks. <laughs>